Well, aloha everyone and welcome back to Chaminade University. Today we're going to cover Unit 11 where we're going to discuss principles of evolution. So to begin we'll talk about how evolutionary thought began to develop and then we'll talk about the process of natural selection and how we're able to tell when evolution has occurred and also the evidence that we have that populations do evolve under natural selection or selective pressure by their environment. So let's give you some definitions to get you started. First of all, evolution is defined as the change over time in the characteristics of a population. And population is defined as all of the individuals of a species that are found in a particular area. And while we have the lens of modern biology, which is the ability to use a lot of our modern techniques to be able to understand how life has evolved. Um, early scientists didn't have access to technologies like that, so they had to use some sort of independent thoughts to be able to get to these conclusions that we now take for granted. So let's go back in history a little bit and talk about some early biological thought that predates evolution. So previous to Darwinian science, so pre-evolutionary theory, we had a lot of theological ideas. Um, remember that the church funded a lot of scientific research and oftentimes they were tied hand in hand with theology, right? So the idea is that all organisms were created simultaneously and then put forth on the earth. And that each life form was permanently fixed and did not have any sort of change over time. And this was proposed by Plato in the idea that um, everything on earth is merely a reflection of a divine form or an ideal form that was actually found in the heavens. And then as we move forward in time, we enter into the Aristotle's range. Aristotle got a little bit closer. He arranged organisms in what he called the ladder of nature. So in a linear scale of increasing complexity, which looks a little bit like this. And he did kind of get it right. As you can see, we do have higher order beings at the top and lower order beings at the bottom. But he also included things like inanimate matter, which we know doesn't actually have any sort of evolution occurring over time. Um, and he also didn't necessarily put things in order of what we know, know, now know is a tree he had as a ladder. So there might be many different lineages compiled within his ladder. But he started to understand that we had lower and higher orders of being. And then we enter into an era where Europeans started exploring the entire planet. And as they started exploring new lands, they started revealing the diversity of life on Earth, and it was overwhelming. Um, so a lot along with these expeditions, they would often have naturalists who would accompany them, and they would collect plants and animals in these newly discovered lands. And by the 1700s, we had thousands upon thousands of different species of organisms revealing the true scope of the variety and diversity of life on Earth. And it was far greater than the expectations. Later in the 18th century, we added more ideas from naturalists where we were able to take note of fascinating patterns that different regions of the planet, different geographic areas, had specialized species that had adapted to those habitats. Um, and they also noticed that species sometimes resembled each other closely and just differed in certain characteristics. And that started to fly in the face of the idea that species were fixed and put here um, at one specific time and never changed from that point forward. In fact, starting to notice that species A closely resembled species B indicated that perhaps these species were related in evolutionary time frame. Okay, so this is an overview of the different ideas of evolutionary thought as they progressed along with the timeline of when these ideas were introduced. So, Originally, the idea was that species were created and put on the planet, and then eventually, perhaps they might evolve. That should be an E. Um, and then Hutton introduced the idea that the geology or the Earth itself might influence how the species change, right? So if the geology changes, perhaps the species might have to change. Um, and then Lamarck introduced the idea that the species do change and perhaps an idea of how, um, indicating that perhaps the environment does play a role in how species progress from one to another. And later we introduced the idea of successive catastrophes, which we do know is something that does influence speciation, um, but is not the only mechanism. And then uh, from there we'll talk about 
overlying fossils. So if we know that the fossil beds are laid down in a particular order, right, the lower layers are put down first and then the medium layers and then the top layers. And so if you look at the fossils that are in the different layers, you can kind of make a sequence of which organisms were introduced on the planet before other organisms. And then eventually we get to Darwin and Wallace who introduced the idea of evolution with natural selection pressures from the environment. All right, so just to walk you through what I just told you, so let's talk about George Louis Leclerc. Um, and that was in the early 1700s. He actually lived until 1788, so around 1750 or so, he started suggesting that there was an original creation event that created a small number of species that he called his founding species, and that these species were subjected to selective pressures, the natural processes, and therefore change slightly over time. Um, and at this point, I want to introduce the idea that we have multiple different lines of evidence that we use to support evolutionary thought and theory, and fossils are one of those lines of evidence. So fossils are basically any preserved remains of organisms that died a long time ago. They're petrified, which means that they have generally become rock, right? They're the remains of bones or wood or shells or even impressions that were left in the mud. You can also have traces like tracks or feces, right, scats, eggs, pollen, burrows, etc. that can allow us to determine what kind of species lived when and where. So this is just an overview of different types of fossils. A very common Shakespearean insult is to call someone a coprolite, which just means that you're a fossilized fecal matter or scats. We also have uh, eggs that could be left in a nest that then got covered um, and never hatched, bones from animals that lived and then died, footprints and skin impressions from animals that wandered through and left their imprint on their surroundings. Um, and fossil evidence is really important because fossil evidence allows us to determine which animals were found where, and by having baselines of certain species, right, if we know that certain fossils are always found in the same layer of rock, then if we find other fossils that we might not know much information about, we can use them relative to our baseline fossils to determine whether they were older or newer than the fossils that we do know about. So the fossil distribution has been a really important record for evolutionary thought and theory, certainly before we get to the point of genetic um, analysis. All right, so this is the rule of layers. Basically, the layers of the rock are going to tell you how old or how young the fossils that are found within them are, right? So if fossil type A is always found in a rock layer resting beneath a younger layer that has fossil type B, right, then that's found resting beneath an even younger layer containing fossil type C. So if fossil type A was laid down in the rock layer first and then B it was laid down in the next rock layer and C laid down in the next rock layer, then you can determine the relative order of these organisms as they roamed the earth. And that actually allows us to show progression of these organisms and that also allows us to demonstrate that um, oftentimes the further apart the fossils are found in the fossil layers, the more different they are from one another. So the fossils that are found in the oldest layer are very, very different from modern organisms. But the younger rocks have a closer resemblance, have fossils that have a closer resemblance to more modern organisms. Oftentimes fossilized species are extinct, and extinct means that we have no more members of this species still alive on the planet today. And we've had a lot of extinctive events. Oftentimes organisms simply outcompete one another, but sometimes we have mass extinctive events with the catastrophes that we were referencing a minute ago, and that would eliminate a lot of species all at once. Um, and oftentimes we have end of lineages, which means that although we have descent with modification, eventually we end up with an organism that simply isn't fit to survive to the next generation, and then they end up going extinct. Um, and so we can use the fossil record to determine a lot of these different um, branches in the evolutionary history. Um, we can use the fossil record to conclude the different type of organisms that lived at which different type in the past. And all of this led to the idea that species were actually not created at one time and stagnant from that point forward. So it flew in the face of the, moder of the current idea at the time, which was that species were put here by God and did not change going forward.
Here's an idea of the stratification I was telling you with the different layers of rock. And so if you know that the oldest rocks are found on the bottom, here's something called a trilobite. Um, and then the younger rocks are found in the middle, something like a seed fern. And then the older, um, sorry, the youngest rocks here are found here at the top. This here is an allosaurus or a dinosaur. And so you can demonstrate then that the trilobite must have lived on Earth at a different time frame and at an older time frame than something like an allosaurus. Right? And if you were to find something like these seed firms somewhere else on the planet with another unknown organism, you could identify approximately how old that organism was by whether or not it was found in the same rock layer, in a younger rock layer, or in an older rock layer. Okay, so at this time, remember, the church is funding a lot of the science, and so while we have an idea that is kind of flying in the face of the church and we have the funding that is coming from the church, we have to reconcile that somehow. And so in 1769 he was born, so it probably would have been about the eight, early 1800s, George Cuvier proposed an idea of catastrophism. And there are several examples of major catastrophes. Some are depicted in the Bible, such as the Great Flood, but we also know that certain things have happened in evolutionary history, such as the meteor hitting the planet, um, which led to extinction of the dinosaurs, for example. So we have multiple different catastrophic events that have happened in um, modern day evolutionary time frames. And we know that modern organisms are survivors of these major catastrophes. Um, but that's not really the only thing that's going on. That's like showing you the major snapshots, but there's a lot of more subtle events that occur as well in terms of um, selective pressures from the natural environment. So Charles Lyell comes forward and starts challenging that idea, saying that it's not just these successive major catastrophic events that are changing the course of which organisms are alive on the planet, right? You can actually just look at the geology, right? The, the actual planet itself and determine that the environment is changing and that environment is leading to the need for the organisms to also change or perish. So Lyle presented an idea called uniformitarianism and basically what he was saying is that the geological processes that we observe today are the same geological processes that were occurring in the past and that the Earth is very ancient and that over time all of these different changes in geology actually cause successive changes in the organisms that were alive on the planet. Um, now, it's not until Baptiste Lamarck comes about that we start having what we would even remotely consider our modern mechanism of evolution. He started observing that the older fossils are a lot less like existing organisms than the more recent fossils, indicating that there is a ma major difference from the older to the newest, much greater than there would be from something that would be more relatively recent to the newest. And so he published a book in 1809 that hypothesized that organisms evolved through required characteristics. So he almost had it right, but he had one key detail wrong. So acquired characteristics would mean that an organism decided to adapt and overcome, right? So it acquired a characteristic throughout its life and use or disuse of that part would then indicate what happened with the next generation. And we know that that's not true, right? If you're put in a situation where you simply can't rise to the challenge, you're going to die. You can't just create gills if you're thrown in the water, right? So we kind of had it right, but really what he's missing here is that there is a variety within the population. And when we have variety within the population, what happens is that if an environmental challenge arises and there is at least one individual within the population that can that has whatever that variety of mutation is that it enables it to survive in that environment, then that's a trait that's going to get passed on to the next generation. So it's not such that an individual can say, I would like to have a tail so that I can then swing through the trees. But if having a tail is in a selective advantage and there is an individual in the population with a tail, they are more likely to pass that on to the next generation because it's an adaptive advantage. So the acquired characteristics is a bit of a leap, but the rest of it, he really started to nail how everything was working. At the same time, you may remember Gregor Mendel, who was a geneticist that worked on pea plants. He got his own lecture, and he started understanding heritable units or inheritance packets that he was calling. They're actually known today as genes and alleles. Um, he started understanding that um, acquired characteristics are not necessarily heritable characteristics. So what we have to have is something that is in the actual genes themselves or in what he called the hereditary packets, these little 
you know, units of DNA that are passed on from parent to offspring. So we have to already have that in the population in order for selective pressure to work. All right, so in come Charles Darwin and Alfred Wallace. And they provide very simple evidence that natural selection is the selective force for evolution. Now, both Darwin and Wallace had completely different educational backgrounds, but they had very similar qualities in that they loved to travel, and they traveled in the tropics. And as you may know, the tropics is an area where we have high um, evolutionary mechanisms. So we have a lot of individual organisms in the tropics that are found nowhere else because we have unique niches and unique habitats that provide spe specialized selective pressure. And Darwin and Wallace started looking at specialty features of species. So um, additionally, they had uh, a lot of familiarity with previous fossil records and understood the studies of Hutton and Lyell. Who, so they knew that the earth was very ancient and had been subjected to multiple different pressures over time. And they both had the idea in mind that they were looking for the mechanism of evolutionary change. So both men knew that change was occurring, but they wanted to understand why. And independently, they came up with two separate but very similar ideas. Basically, the idea is that the environment provides the selective pressure for an organism to survive or not to survive. And when we say survive and not survive, we're actually talking about reproductive capability. So I want to make that clear. Just surviving is not enough. Surviving and passing your traits on to the next generation is what it takes. So you need to actually be able to survive and reproduce. So we're talking about reproductive fitness, which is, of course, tied to, for example, the ability to eat. So let's talk about the finches. So Darwin studied finches in the Galapagos Islands, and he noted that the finches had multiple different characteristics of their beaks, and those beak sizes and shapes and lengths were all suited to their food source. So in A, we see a large ground finch, which has a beak that's suited for large seeds, able to pick them up and break them open very easily. Here we have B, and anybody here who lives in Hawaii knows that's a noni, right? Um, but they have a ground finch. This ground finch has a small beak, and it's able to pick out small seeds to be able to eat tinier things, able to pick them up more delicately off of the ground. This beak would not be suited for large seeds. It wouldn't be able to break them open. And this beak would not be suited for small seeds because it wouldn't be able to pick them up. Additionally, here's a warbler finch. It has a beak suited to pluck insects out of the air. And a vegetarian tree finch, which has the ability to eat the leaves, right? So it has a nice strong jaw that's going to mash those leaves into a pulp before swallowing. Now, each of these finches all came from a common ancestor and had a specialty food source that over time led to adaptive and selective changes over the population, again, not for an individual, but over the population that allowed for changes in the population over time to end up with these phenotypic or outward appearances that are suited for their environment. All right, so Darwin and Wallace together, independently, proposed mechanisms of natural selective pressures that allow organisms to evolve. And they presented papers in 1858 um, in London. Darwin's was Darwin's paper led to the publication of Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection, which was published in 1859 and is still widely renowned today as one of the most pressing um, manuscripts on evolutionary theory. So what's the idea? The central idea is that we have descent with modification. So every generation is slightly different from the preceding generation. And while those changes are not really detectable from one generation to the next, over very long time periods, those small differences build up or accumulate and are able to produce major transformations. All right, so these theories of evolution rest on four major postulates. The first postulate is that all of the individual members of the population must differ in many respects. That means we cannot have a homogenous population. We have to have a heterogeneous population. What does that mean? That means that they have multiple different characteristics that are not necessarily shared that have a different variety of traits. All right, and 
these traits have to be heritable. That means that they have to be passed on from parent to offspring, and that's postulate number two. Postulate number three is that there's some sort of selective pressure, okay? So it's not utopia. Not 100% of the members are going to survive to reproductive age. Some individuals have reproductive success, and other individuals do not. And last but not least, that reproductive success has to be linked to those individual characteristics that we just talked about. So an example of when postulate four would not be come into play would be something like seeds falling in a parking lot that is in the hot heat with no, um, no water. Those seeds have no chance, no matter if they're carrying genes that are going to be better or worse for the individual, right? Um, so this Postulate number four basically indicates that every individual has the same original chance, but their characteristics determine their likelihood of success. All right, so let's get back to postulate number one. Individuals in a population vary, and we know that, right? Almost every population has a ton of variety in it. The human population, for example, has different heights, different eye color, skin color, physical features and characteristics. Um, and this variability is present in the populations of all different types of organisms. And, for example, here's a snail population. Lots of different variation of snail color. Now, if we all had the same percentage chance of success, all of these snails would survive. But if you could imagine, perhaps, that a predator is selective for yellow snails and only eats the snails with the yellow shell, then the next generation we might have more brown shells. If the opposite were true and the predator only ate the brown shells, um, then the yellow snails would have a higher percentage, yellow shells would be a higher percentage in the next population, right? So we start with the variation, and then we have some sort of selective pressure that changes the individual's chance for what we call reproductive fitness, or the ability of that individual to have offspring. And again, we have to make sure that the traits that, are, that we're talking about are passed down from parent to offspring. So an example of this would be if someone gets a tattoo, Right? That tattoo would not be passed on from parent to offspring. So if that tattoo did increase or decrease their reproductive success, that reproductive success change would not necessarily be, would not at all be passed on to the next generation. Right? So it has to be something that is heritable. All right, so that third postulate is that some individuals fail to survive. This is not utopia. There is a selective pressure in the environment whereby certain snails are going to be eaten, for example. And this selective pressure is only on reproductive fitness. So if you end up being eaten after you've had your children, you still have reproductive success. So organisms that are born have to survive long enough to reproduce and then have reproductive success in order to be considered fit. All right, last but not least, that survival and reproduction is not just random chance, right? We're not factoring in the people who just get hit by a bus, right? We're assuming that no matter what your eye color, you're going to get hit by the bus at the same frequency, right? So in order to have reproductive success, it has to be defined by the individual's characteristics and not be reliant on something random chance in the environment, right? So winners are not just determined by chance, but by the specific characteristics that they possess that increase their reproductive fitness. Okay, so natural selective efforts are constantly occurring and acting on all of the individuals within the population, and that leads to a change in the traits of the population over time. What that means is that over time, the individuals that have that fa favorable trait are going to increase, and the percentage of the individuals that have non-favorable traits are going to decrease. And again, as a whole, a population evolves, but an individual does not evolve. You can't just decide to have the favorable trait. You can't decide, okay, everyone seems to really like blue eyes, I'm going to change my eye color. Although I suppose you could do that with contact lenses. But my point is that the favorable traits have to be heritable and that you are given a set of cards. You're already dealt with those cards, right? So you don't get to change the traits that you have as an individual, but as a population over time, the amount of individuals with a particular trait can change because the amount of individuals with that particular particular trait increase or re decrease their reproductive success, leading to changes in the next generation. Okay, so evolution is a generally accepted scientific theory today, um, and again, we use the word theory differently as scientists, right? Theory is something that's a very strong word in the scientific community. It's a general explanation um, through extensive reproducible observations that has never been disproven. So what kind of evidence supports this theory of evolution? Well, we talked about the fossil record originally. Um, next, we'll talk about comparative anatomy. And that means that we're looking at the anatomy from different species and seeing how it is similar or how it is different in terms of how the body structures of different species um, relate to one another.
We can also look at embryology, and embryology is actually very similar from almost all mammals, for example, um, because genes that are turned on and off at different stages of development are critical for that individual to survive, and so if there's an issue with that, generally that leads to the individual not coming to term and therefore not being born, and that gives you zero reproductive success. So we can look at how closely linked the individual species are in terms of their embryological events or the specific characteristics of when things are turned on and turned on off from the period of fertilization to birth. We can look at biochemistry, so we can look at the specific enzymes, for example, inside the individual's organisms, or we can look at the genetics as well. We do that quite often. We look at the comparison of the genetics of one species to another. Um, so let's talk about fossils just to recap. Fossils are any remains of species, of specific uh, specifically ancestral species, um, all the way to the modern era. And they begin with the ancient organism. Usually that's going to be the very lowest level. And we hopefully can watch them progress through intermediate stages. Of course, some of those are lost. If you think, for example, Lucy, which is the, the direct link between um, hominid species and humankind. And, uh, and then how that culminates in modern species. So we have multiple different series of fossils that allow us to demonstrate the evolution of body structures over time. And that suggests that new species evolved from and outcompeted and then replaced previous species. And you can consider this something like iPhone technology, right? And this is when I would typically look at the class and I would ask everyone here, how many people have an iPhone 10? And then I would work my way backwards, 9, 8, 7, right? And eventually I get to the point where I ask iPhone 4. Usually I don't have anyone left with an iPhone 4 and I ask, you know, how many people's mother or grandmother has an iPhone 4? How many people know anyone with an iPhone 4? And then I work my way back to 3, 2, and no one by this point knows anyone with an iPhone 2. Why? Because iPhones, when they first came out, were the most amazing thing, right? So an iPhone 1 and an iPhone 2 were the, incredible at that era, but when 3 came out, it drastically outcompeted 2, and people switched to 3, and then 4 drastically outcompeted 3, and 5 outcompeted 4, etc., until the point where 2 and 3 became so obsolete that they actually were outcompeted. And that's what happens in the animal kingdom as well, right? A successor outcompetes its predecessor and eventually drives that predecessor to extinction. Um, but we can see these modern um, ancestors, or sorry, these modern species and how they relate to their ancestors in an example here from modern whales. So here are modern whales, and you can see we have a little what we call vestigial structure. We'll talk about those in a second. But they actually arose from land-dwelling creatures that then ended up in the shallows and then eventually ended up being able to wade around the shallows well and then ended up with webbed feet and a tail turning into this dorudon, which eventually led to this bacillosaurus. Again, we still have vestigial structures. Vestigial structures are structures that are not selected for or against, but have entered into disuse over long periods of time, like these non-weight-bearing back limbs in the bacillosaurus and the modern whale. All right, so we can use comparative anatomy, and that's what we just did. We just looked at the anatomy of the different whales, and we looked at the changes over time, which is basically what we refer to as descent with modification, right? So if we look at the different bodies of organisms from different species and look at their similarities and their differences, then we can explain that generally by determining shared ancestry. And of course, we're going to use all of these different methods, the fossil record, comparative anatomy, biochemistry, embryology. We're going to use all of these together in concert to be able to determine what we call phylogenic trees or the lineages of these different species. And by comparing the bodies of these different organisms, we can figure out the, the differences or the changes over time that occur from descent from a common ancestor under selective pressure. We can also look at what's called homologous structures. Homologous structures are structures that have the same evolutionary origin, but have a different appearance or function. And a good example of this would be forelimbs. So for example, birds and mammals have the similar structures in their forelimbs. These are called homologous, homologous structures, and they're used for different things, such as flying, swimming, running, grasping objects. However, they have similar anatomical similarities, even though they have very, very different uses. Um, and that's exactly what we would expect if they were derived from a common ancestor. And so this is what that looks like. Here's a pterodactyl wing. Interestingly enough, the pterodactyl actually creates most of its wing from the extension of what we would consider to be our pinky, right? 
Um, a bird wing is going to be a lot different from a pterodactyl wing in that the bird wing is actually comprised of, this is the humerus or the upper arm bone. This is the radius and ulna, which is what you would consider in your lower arm. And then these would be what we have in our hands, right? Our carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges. So here, let me talk about the human before we jump right in here. This is if you look at your own arm. This is from your shoulder going to your elbow. It's called your humerus. That's why they call this your funny bone, by the way. And when you hit it, it doesn't make you laugh at all. Um, and then if we travel down your forearm, you have two bones. You have the ulna, which connects from the elbow to the pinky, and the radius, which connects from the elbow to the thumb. And then those are met by your carpals, which are your wrist bones, your um, metacarpals are the bones that are in your hand itself, and your phalanges are your fingers. Now, if you look at a dog, they have very similar structure, but they have it set up a little bit differently because it's going to be much more weight-bearing, right? So that elbow that we would consider to be more along the lines of grasping and using it for dexterity is actually used to be weight-bearing in something like a dog or a sheep. So you can see that they have much stronger ulna here than we do. And the seal, same thing. They're using it for swimming instead of for walking, but they use it quite a lot for strength, so it's going to be a very strong bone. But you can see we have much very similar characteristics in a seal and a dolphin in terms of how these are positioned, even though we have much difference in characteristics in terms of their size and their structures themselves. Same thing here with the pterodactyl, right? We still have that humerus, ulna, radius, carpals, metacarpals, and that really long phalange even that far back. So these are all considered homologous structures. That means that they come from a common ancestor. All right. Um, we also have those vestigial structures I just talked about. They're considered functionless, essentially. They're inherited from your ancestors. And they have no essential function currently, but they come from a time frame when the organism would have needed that structure. An example of that would be molar teeth and vampire bats. Vampire bats live on blood. They don't chew at all. Why do they need teeth? Well, apparently their ancestrals, ancestors would have used these structures to be able to digest food or to chew up food when they were living on diet that didn't consist of entirely blood. So again, vestigial structures. Here's another need to actually have any weight bearing on their, their back limbs. They don't actually have back limbs, but they still have pelvic bones, which are meant to connect to back limbs. Same thing with certain snakes. Certain snakes also have pelvic bones when they don't have any actual legs, right? These are vestigial structures, and they look kind of like this. So here's from the salamander, which would have been the um, evolutionary species. The species did walk around, was responsible for hind limb function and support and locomotion, etc. But if you look at a baleen whale, they have these vestigial structures. Those, it's not even connected to the spinal column anymore, but there's nothing that is going to, in an evolutionary perspective, select against it, so it's going to continue to persist in the population. Here's a boa constrictor, for example. Again, we also have these vestigial bones. They have no actual function, but they haven't been selected against, so they still exist. So using comparative anatomy, we can figure out similarities and differences from organisms and then tie that back to their environment. So we'll have anatomical similarities in similar environments and then sometimes we'll have anatomical differences because they had to rise to different anatomical challenges. However, I would be remiss if I didn't talk about anatomical similarities that kind of arise um, of their own accord. So they don't stem from common ancestry, they stem from a common need. For example, flight, right? In order to fly you need wings. But we get to the challenge, we overcome the challenge of flight in multiple different ways. So the wings on a dragonfly, for example, are very different from the wings on a bird. That's called convergent evolution. And basically what happens is natural selection causes structures that are not homologous and need to serve similar functions to have a resemblance even though they don't have a common ancestor. Um, and that's because we have parallel modification of different ancestral lineages lineages occurring on different non-homologous structures but getting to the same end function because in order to arise to the challenge of flight you have to come up with a wing structure of some sort. Um, and so natural selection in favor of flight is going to evolve wings even though we're looking at two different lineages and that's called convergent evolution. All right, let's talk about analogous structures. Analogous structures are structures that are um, very similar in appearance but again, different in their evolutionary origin. Um, they're very different in their internal anatomy. So we don't have homologous structures. Homologous would be that they arose from a common ancestor. Um, and so these parts are not derived from a common ancestor. And again, this is what I was just talking about with a damselfly and a swallow. So even though they came to the same challenge, flight, they overcame the challenge with the same features, wings. They did it from different lineages.
right, in different evolutionary timelines on different um, analogous structures. Okay, so let's talk about embryology for a second. Embryology is very, very similar from organisms very far back in our um, evolutionary lineages. And that's because evolution, uh, evolutionarily, embryology is very tightly regulated in which genes get turned on at what stages of embryological development. So in the early 1800s, we noticed this. Carl von Baer was the first one to make these no notations. Notice that all vertebrate embryos resemble each other very closely in early development. Everything from fish um, all the way to humans have a tail and a gill slits. They're called gill grooves during their early embryonic stages. Um, but yet only the adult fish retain their gills and tails because those genes are turned on um, all the way through their embryonic development, wherein, as in humans, and chickens and mice, they're turned off early on in embryonic development. And as I mentioned, it's very difficult to tell embryolog embryologically the difference between, for example, a lemur, a pig, and a human. If I didn't have these labels here, it would be very difficult for you to pick out which one of these was a human embryo, even though they turn into completely different organisms as adults. So that's the process of embryology, comparing the different stages of embryological development in order to determine how closely related these organisms are. We can also use other biochemical and genetic analyses to look at the relatedness of organisms. And that just came about in a very recent time frame, in the past 20 to 30 years or so, where modern technology allows us to look at the molecular similarities and differences amongst organisms. And this biochemical similarity allows us a very striking evidence of the relatedness, evolutionarily speaking, of organisms. And the relatedness is revealed by what we call homologous molecules. So how closely related are the molecules within these organisms? And we use something called DNA sequencing to look at this. So we can look at every single nucleotide in the entire DNA sequence of an individual and determine that and then compare it back to other organisms. And when we look at the DNA of one organism and compare it to a different organism, for example, here are the, the example they're giving is the protein cytochrome C, and it's found in all plants and animals and performs the same function. And so if they look at this molecule and look at the similarities across multiple different lineages, then they can determine how closely related different organisms are, biochemically speaking. We can also, for example, look at DNA and RNA because all cells use DNA to carry their genetic information and they all use RNA and ribosomes um, to translate that genetic information. And so we can look at these different changes, these slight changes in these sequences and determine the molecular relatedness of these organisms. This is what this looks like when we're looking at molecular similarity. So here's a human and a mouse, and we're looking at a specific gene. And you can see that even though the human and a mouse are very, very different phenotypically, um, they're going to be very similar in terms of their molecular sequence. In fact, only these slight changes are going to, in this one region, of course, we have a whole genome, but you can see it's, what, 10% difference, um, less than that, that's going to create, account for all of the differences between the human and the mouse. Um, we also have, for many, many generations, undergone the process of artificial selection. So I would be remiss if I talked about natural selection without talking about artificial selection, which works under similar parameters as natural selection. Instead of having selective pressure being environmental, however, the selective pressure is um, going to be human. So humans, for example, have undergone selective breeding of domestic plants and animals like modern dogs, etc. All modern dogs are descended from wolves and crossbreed readily today, and the entire descent of all all of the major breeds of modern dogs have all occurred over just a few thousand years. So if you think about all of the different traits of all of the different types of dogs and how different they are, they all came from a common ancestor just a few thousand years ago. And that common ancestor here would be the gray wolf, and this is a multiple diverse lineage of different types of dogs. And so controlled breeding is also a way of modifying organisms. It's a method of artificial selection. And we've done this both in um, animal populations, but also in our food population. For example, modern corn is descended from something that was approximately two inches long. Um, and then we selected for the sweetest cobs, the uh, sweetest kernels, the largest kernels, the hardiest plants, etc. And over time, we got the corn that we have today. Um, and so over a relatively short period of time through the process of artificial selection, we've created tremendous variation in multiple different species, both plants and animal. And so if we extend that out on a larger scale, it becomes very plausible that much larger changes could have resulted from hundreds of millions of years of natural selective pressure of all regions 
of the planets. And we do still see natural selection occurring today. Um, an example of natural selection would be, for example, brighter coloration. Here, I'll give you the example that they're showing you here is the Trinidad Guppy experiment. So there's two sets of selective pressure in this original experiment. First, we have selective pressure, mate selective pressure, or sexual selection, whereby female guppies prefer to mate with the brightly colored males. So the brighter you are as a male, the more likely you are to mate. However, the brighter you are as a male, the more likely you are to be eaten. So you have selective pressure from both sides. Be bright enough to be picked, but don't be the brightest one or you'll be eaten. Okay? So... In areas where predators were lacking, male be males became more and more and more brightly colored, and that's because se sexual selective pressure was pushing in one direction, right, making the males more colorful. However, when we had predators involved, we have dual pressure. We have pressure from predation as well as sexual selection. So those males are going to be duller by comparison because the predators are going to eliminate the brightly colored males before they're able to reproduce. So that's just by introducing or removing one predator. So when we have less predators present, we have brighter coloration evolving over just a few generations. And that confirmed the conclusion that when predators were introduced, that we confirmed that conclusion by introducing predators to areas that were previously predator-free, where we originally had very brightly colored males, and after a few generations, the male guppies revolved to be less and less colorful because of the predatory selection. This is just an example of a male guppy from a uh, predator-free environment and from an area of predation. So they still have some shine, but they're not the shiniest ones. Um, we also have evidence of natural selection occurring today in terms of herbicide and pesticide resistance. So we have a ton of weed species that have evolved resistance to the herbicides that we use to try to control them. Same thing with pests, right? The pests have ended up having resistance to the pesticides that we are trying to use to control them. Here's an example of uh, a specific hurdle that the plants have had to overcome, the weeds have had to overcome. So agriculture depends on the ability to kill weeds that compete with crop plants. And a ingredient found in Roundup that used to be very successful is no longer successful. That ingredient is called glyphosate. Glyphosate inactivates an essential enzyme in the plants. However, ragweed which is a weed, right, has a high resistance now to the glyphosate. So they have survivors of the glyphosate, so they've been exposed. And then the next generation, the ones that have a mutation, is going to increase the amount of those in that population. So that mutation becomes more prevalent over time. And that mutation causes them to produce way more of that enzyme than they need. So the enzyme that glyphosate attacks is produced in excess. And so glyphosate cannot destroy all of that enzyme, and therefore that organism is able to survive. And that has allowed for an evolution of glyphosate-resistant superweeds in a very short time frame as a direct result in changes to agricultural practices. And similar to the way weeds have evolved a resistance to herbicides, also insects have evolved a resistance to pesticides. In fact, over 500 species of crop-damaging insects have been documented over time, and um, all, almost all of these have been able to, almost every pesticide that's been introduced has had an evolutionary resistance that's occurred in at least one major species. Here's another recent example of natural selection. Anola sangre are, are small lizards, and they were introduced into the Bohemian Islands, so in islands of the Bahamas, 14 different islands with thinly branched bushes and no trees at all. Originally, the lizards came from Staniel Cay, which is an island that had thickly branched trees, and they had long legs, so they were able to maneuver very quickly along the thick branches of the trees. But on the new islands, they had thin bushes and no trees. Fourteen years later, they made comparisons among the lizards of the islands and those of the original Staniel Cay population. And the original groups had given rise to thriving populations of hundreds of individuals on all of the different islands. However, all 14 of the all individuals on all four to the islands had shorter and thinner legs. And that means that the lizard population had actually evolved in response to the new environment and the selective pressure. The natural selection appeared to favor whatever individuals had shorter legs that were thinner legs because they were able to move more agilely along the thinner vegetation of the new islands. And that meant that they were able to escape predators better than the longer-legged ancestors in the new environment.
That means that the shorter leg lizards survived, passed their genes for shorter legs on to the next generation, and that gene therefore became more prevalent, and that phenotype or outward appearance became more prevalent in the next population. Here's just an image of the anole, and this just shows you their difference in their leg size. These are the smaller legs on the smaller bushes. All right, so these are multiple experiments that have demonstrated that natural selection is still occurring today in populations. And these examples include the Trinidadian guppies that I just talked about, the extra enzyme or the overwhelming enzyme in the giant ragweed plants, and the shorter legs in the bohemian lizards. So that means that natural selection is constantly occurring. And I want you to be very clear here. Natural selection doesn't necessarily have a best absolute outcome, right? Best is relative to your situation. So best means that you're able to best survive to the environmental challenge that's presented to you. However, when you're put in a different environment, you have different selective pressures, an individual that was thriving in population A might not be the one that's selected for in population B. So two sets of populations that are put in different selective pressures, different environments, may end up changing over time to the point where they're no longer able to interbreed, and that's called speciation, and we'll talk about that in a, in a later chapter. So natural selection is not best in a specific sense, but is best for the context of whatever is happening in your particular environment. All right, so I'm going to stop here, and I appreciate you guys taking the time to listen to me today. Aloha and happy studying.